Hey guys, how you doing? This is Mick Tully for the World Martial Arts Television Show. Um, we've come back and we're just going to have another chat with the legend that is, I'm sorry, I have to call him a legend, the legend that is Mahi, Mahi Palunia. Uh, literally, you got my grey matter going absolutely crazy when we were talking about speed last time. And then the minute I finished it, I was like, I needed more time because we hadn't really, well, we hadn't looked into, we hadn't dove deep enough into the whole idea of speed. And of course, I came at it like as a seasoned martial artist and I'm thinking speed. Yeah, I know what that is. And uh, yeah, you, you, you posed a few questions and uh, I, 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 want, I want some more answers if possible. So when we were talking about speed, you were talking about beyond sensitivity and beyond speed. So I'd like to go there because that to me normally feels a bit woo woo, but it made complete sense when we were talking. So Mahi explain the whole beyond speed, beyond sensitivity, please. First of all, thank you for getting me back here. So thinking where to start, um, look, language can both imprison us and can open the world up, right? So many a times what language does is we, we when we hear the words, it, it basically becomes a framework and our definition of it becomes the prison within which we live, right? So, yeah. uh, uh, so we, we create these constructs and those constructs become the art of what you think is possible. So anytime, you are looking to move beyond that particular construct, you're entering into the world of beyond the possible or the art of the impossible, right? And at one, at one point in time, the four, the four minute mile was impossible, right? At one point yeah. in time, um, heavier than air flight was impossible. And then some bloke did it, right? And now suddenly everyone's able to do it. Right. Yeah. So what changes is how we perceive things and the constructs of what we think is possible. So it usually involves the first step is that we have to change our cognition of what we think we mean or what we think we understand by these particular things. You know, one such person is Pat Strong. When he would talk about uh, beyond speed, I'm like, what the hell does that mean? It means that if you're thinking about speed, you're too slow. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you know, even in speaking with Leo Fong, he would talk about uh, this particular thing that Bruce and he would do at a restaurant where Leo and Bruce would be eating and he would see Bruce twitching every few seconds. And he asked him, what are you doing? And he had to tie back in and say, oh, yeah, every time I see this person move, I move this finger. Every time I see that person move, I move that finger, blah, blah, blah. So he's like, for what? He's like, well, you're training all the time. So that any time there's a particular movement, I don't have to think about reaction. It just happens. Wow. Okay. And then Pat Strong took that to a whole different level where he even goes beyond, uh, you know, you think about intentional hitting. Okay, I'm going to go in and do this. But the fact that you have an intention and thought, you are slow because thought requires time. Right. Yeah. So you're going into this place where there's an absence of thought and you are in a deep relationship. So say you and I are sparring, right? For example, you and I are actually in a dance. We are in a relationship, right? So anytime there is a trigger that comes from you, a tell that comes from you and my system recognizes it, it's already happened. Right? So that is the high art. So now we have to start thinking about speed, not just in terms of an initiation speed or the quickness that I move, but start having a systemic view of you and me as a dance and that anything that moves, anything that happens, right? It's an initiation that's already happened. My mind has already figured out all the options and the response has taken place. So that is what we are calling beyond speed because the reason we are saying beyond speed and not just speed is people like like a lot of us when we hear speed we think we know what it means and that mm -hmm. becomes the prison so if you want to break the prison you have to break the language but 
No, you don't mind, don't mind me just interjecting here. You said two things that immediately got my Jeet Kune Do brain going, right? The first thing was when you were saying about the relationship and this emotional thing, right? So I, I've been to so many seminars uh, and they're normally awful people. But, I mean, they're, they're, the quality of their, uh, their teaching and art is awful because they start doing that real emotional content and they do that line from Enter the Dragon. And then the other thing that you mentioned when you were talking about Beyond Speed, I immediately thought that, like, that it was the staple for so many years in Jeet Kune Do, the non-telegraphed punch, which is literally, it is, that's like the, the first step. Well, as you're talking to me, I'm looking at it, I'm going, right, so Bruce might be doing this with his finger, but the first step in all of it is, everyone always talks about Bruce having great reactions. I don't believe he had great reactions. What I believe he was really good at doing was creating an environment where his action became a reaction. Does that make sense? Or am I makes, thinking that? No, no, no. It makes perfect sense, right? Because it's the art of setup, right? So where I get you to make a, a folly, if you will, and your yeah. folly becomes, in jazz, you would say that becomes the utilization that I use in order for me yeah. to land what I would do. Right. And yeah, I hate the term emotional content, especially from some of our colleagues. Right. Uh, uh, but it's true. You know, I was I was working with this uh, a world renowned musician and he's also a world class martial artist. Uh, so, I mean, he played for the London Symphony. He had a magic show at uh, um, he had a magic show at Caesar's Palace for years. OK. And he's a gymnast and a martial artist. He's one of those, you know, polymaths, yeah. you know? It took me years to get him uh, to sit down with me and take what I'm doing seriously, but he finally did, you know? And working and talking with him is like, look, I'm not interested in your physical stuff. I know you have some, a, a degree of awareness and a degree of doing things. It's like, let's get into the emotional piece. And I was like, oh no, please don't use that word. Cause my mind went yeah. right to, you know, that line. He has nothing to do with Bruce Lee. He's not even connected with him. He's very much into a traditional Kenjitsu art, right? Right. Uh, and then he's like, what makes my music better than others' music? What allowed me to get into the London Symphony was my emotional content, right? And his whole idea of how to tap into that, how to tap into that, that being where I'm, I'm almost going to sound religious here, right? But it's, 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 it's like, the will of the music plays through. The will, the yeah. intention of something greater than you is channeled through. So uh, I think, but for that, again, you need an absence of language because as long as your language is there, it means your ego is operating. And especially if you are in a yellow tracksuit these days and saying, oh, well, it's very yellow. Uh, yeah. And you know, <laughs> and uh, you, you're doing that, it, it sounds awful, it sounds awful. Yeah, it, it, well, it, it's funny you said that it just, as you're saying this, it's like there's stuff going off in my head that I've remembered from years ago. I remember a really dear friend of mine, Jeff Thompson, who used to talk about him becoming a conduit. Yes. Uh, and he, he said it, and the first couple of times he said it, I was like, you have lost the plot, mate. And then obviously the more people that I trained with who were of a really high level like rick Fay used to always say it's like magic he said i'll be moving around and then it just happens like the brazilians he goes i don't know where it came from and i've learned it somewhere but i don't know but then the brazilians are the same because the brazilians you have to ask them what they did they went you'll have to show me what i did i don't know i was doing it and you're like well you're not a very good teacher and they're like yeah but i'm 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 a conduit here i, I don't oh, get control I... over what's coming through that see to me that already signals mastery of, of a certain level, you know, because uh, 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 they just allow themselves to become the vehicle through which yeah. the technique happens, number one. And it goes one step beyond that, you know, and it was brilliantly shown in the movie, The Last Samurai. If, if, if you've seen that movie, right? Uh, when uh, Tom Cruise's character is surrounded by uh, all these uh, Japanese imperial guards on the bridge. And he, go, yeah. he, you know, he does this kenjutsu, he cuts them all. He doesn't know what he's doing. And then a second after that, the whole thing replays in his mind. Yeah. Right? And 
I've experienced that one or two times. And I know a few people who experience that all the time. That post it, post technique, they take a second, they calm down, and the whole thing just plays for itself again, almost in slow motion. So that degree of attunement and that degree of uh, egolessness, if you will, or no mind is, is critical for that mastery. But if you're out there beating your chest, beat your ass, beat your ass, then you're looking at, uh, you want the 10 cameras there to give you all the angles to tell you what you think you may have done. Yeah, you see, it's, it's funny you said that because obviously as I'm getting older now, a lot of the stuff that I poo-pooed in martial arts is now uh, is quite fascinating to me. So the, the, you know, the search for Zen, all of that, you know, I used to see guys and they'd be like, oh, you know, I just want to do this. I want to walk, you know, uh, you know, with that calm mind and stuff. And I'm like, no, you want to be in the rook, mate. And then obviously as I've got older, I'm like, no. That is exactly what, to be all things at the same time, you know what I mean? I know it sounds very Buddhist, but it is that point where you go, that I want to be totally aware of what I'm doing, but totally ignorant of what I'm doing at the same time and be happy with that. And I know that makes me sound like, you know, a bargain basement philosopher, but isn't that, isn't that what we want to get into, you know? I, I, I would think so, because look, we, we spend, especially in modern society, right, we Guys like you and me, we've spent three, four decades, whatever, right, uh, doing this stuff. And if we still don't know how to protect ourselves, we should ask for refunds, right? So, yeah. so why are we doing this? Just so that we continue, uh, just continue trying to beat a guy in a fight that most of us will never get into? Mm. I mean, it's stupid. It's downright stupid if you think about it. So there has to be a higher purpose, whether it's the expression of yourself and finding your art through it, number one, or number two, you're tapping into things that are outside the realm of normal possibility because that's what being exquisite is, isn't it? Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, you're talking about as we get older, we are thinking about, oh, the things we foo food, you know, it's that like that old saying, when you're 12, your dad is a stupid man. And when you're 35, your dad is the smartest man, you know. Exactly that. Yeah, that's that classic line, isn't it? I yeah. went to I, I went to college. and My dad was the biggest idiot I ever met. And I couldn't work out how he got so smart in those four years I was away. You know, and it is it is true. It's a, it's it's funny. It's funny. You just said uh when you were talking about the metaphysical thing, because uh, I went to see Oppenheimer yesterday, the movie. Uh, I found it amazing. It was really funny because I was watching it, and obviously everyone knows everything about J. Robert Oppenheimer. You know, the guy changed the world, and he did. Uh, but when they, they touched on to the metaphysical side of stuff, and well, he goes... Exactly, because he's quoting the Bhagavad Gita. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But then you see that, that was, that was, that was really, really cool. But then it, it's, there's this section in it where he's basically chatting up his soon to be wife and he, she's trying to say to him, explain to me quantum, quantum physics. And he said, well, we're just a lot of nothing connected together by a few atoms. And my head was going, what? I only went there to see the bomb. You know what I mean? That was all I was looking for, but it was, you know, if, if you don't mind, Mahi, we touched on the metaphysical before. We talked, we touched on, uh, as I said, this is really the crux of why I wanted to talk to you today. When we were talking about speed, we talked about speed in a very physical, like, pardon the pun, physical, physics way. Um, but I, I'd like, you know, just your insights on when we talked about speed, speed of thought, you you sent me down a really dark path there because I was on YouTube then for two hours trying to figure it all out. But tell me where it starts physically and then tell me if we do know, where does it end up? You know? Let's start with the ending because that's the easiest part. You right. look, he dies, right? <laughs> yeah, cool. So, that, so that's the easy part. Now, the hard part is where does it start? Um, so. I think here, you know, I'd like to bring John Boyd's work in, you know, with the Uda loop. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it's observe, orient, uh, decide and act, right? 
Uh, see, act is what we do all the time. We're training for it. Uh, we're doing the reps. We're doing the drills, right? The decide is where we are building, hen, in Japanese, you would say henka or, or, or we would say plays or uh, permutations and combinations. You know, you just learn one technique, say the guillotine, how many ways can I apply the guillotine, right? So yeah. that's the henka, right? Then the orientation. Orientation is, okay, how do I position myself in a place where I can now actually apply the guillotine or do the setup for the guillotine? So this is a progression, right? You're not going to be thinking about orientation when you when you've had class one on the guillotine. Class one on the guillotine is like, how do I not get there, right? Yes. Uh, and then the, the last step is the hardest part, which is um, observe. Learning to see the lines, learning to see the patterns. And then there is one other piece beyond that, right? And that is uh, sensing. I don't want to say seeing, but use the word sensing, sensing intent. Ah, now I'm gonna I'm gonna have to jump in here, right? So I now I overly simplify this, right? So the OODA loop. When I first read about the OODA, it was roughly at the same time. So the OODA loop was one thing, and then the Cooper code was the other on the color coding thing. And I literally learned those within a week of each other. And it blew my mind because up until that, I was only a young guy that I was probably 18, 19. And the OODA loop, and I was like, that, that's everything I, that I do, everything. And I was like, there's a science behind this behavior. And then obviously, that was when I, that, I know this term was bandied around a long time. So Jeet Kune Do was scientific street fighting, right? And uh, I think we can, we can all agree that they had a more scientific approach than anyone else up until that point, I think, in the Western world anyway, right? But now this is the thing that I come out with, and it, it's an oversimplification, but I do it all the time. When I talk about intent, I always say, you make the shape of a guy who's going to do this. And I said, and I've seen that shape a few times. So at the minute that you were saying about sensing, uh, I, I, it's, the, here's a great way to explain it. When you walk into a place, you can tell menace from certain people because they just have a menacing shape. The way that they conduct themselves and they carry themselves, you just look at that and go, this shit never ends well. That, that shape that you're making, that guy isn't normally a nice guy. So I came to that conclusion literally just through common sense. So how did you come to that conclusion when you were talking about sense? I wish I had that much common sense. Uh, it was me getting my ass handed to me more times than I can remember as a as a little Indian kid, right? Well, I, I, no, but that's the same thing with me. When I say I came to my own common sense, it was just because most of the time, she's uh, I'm just, same, I'm just, they made no, no, no. Mahi, I'm just I making think, light of it, you know. I'm just, Mahi, I'm just Mahi, I, Mahi. I hate taking it. I hate taking Mahi. this stuff seriously. No, no, no. Exactly, exactly the same thing, bro. And literally, what I was going to say was, when I say common sense. I was going to say, these guys made the same shape as my dad used to make just before he gave me a hiding. Yeah. Because yeah. It's, all, it's, not, it's a universal thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think, I think a lot of people see the OODA loop backwards, in my opinion. Right. Okay? So they start from the observe, and then they say, okay, then I'm going to go to act. But really what we're generally doing is we're acting and thinking later. Right. And because the acting happens in the reptilian brain, the the decision is usually emotional. Yeah. Right. Uh, that is happening in your limbic brain, your midbrain. The actual observing, uh, the actual observing and orientation is what happens in your prefrontal cortex, your executive function. Yeah. All this. So as you're going from the act to the decide, the act and the decide is in my body. Right. The, the orientation and observing, that is a relationship between me and you, where yeah. I'm not only aware of me, but I'm also aware of you, right? And when you are sensing intent, you're not aware of yourself. You've stepped out, right? And then yeah. that's where something else comes in. So, so that happens over a period of time, in my opinion. And, you know, that does 
that's the stuff that I'm pursuing that trying to tap into, right? That happens over a period of time. So when people think about the OODA loop or they throw the word OODA loop out, and I did that too, you know, I always thought, okay, I'll observe and then I will orient myself and then I'll decide and then I'll act. It's too late, mate. Mm. You're dead because the act has already begun. So either you start from the act and move into things or you're sensing intent and preparing right there before you even before you even come into fight range. And, and you know, the best place to see this is watch what some of the prison videos of movies in prisons right? Mm. The people are 25, 30 feet apart and they're just feeling and sensing each other out. And they, the way they move, the way they act, the way they do the setups, right? That is scientific for me. Not the movies, yeah. but you know, the, the fact that this actually happens and, and you know, guys get wiped out. Uh, you, you, that, there's two things there. First of all, right? You have literally blown my mind on one thing right because i've been thinking about this for ages right so i've been reassessing i've been doing a load of interviews recently and i've been really like I've, I've been having to talk about you know my beginnings in martial arts and stuff right so um especially in confrontation i realized that at least for 30 years of my life i basically when it came down to it i lived in the limbic region of my brain literally and there was like monopoly mahi do not pass go do not collect 200 pounds go straight to jail here in my head and i was straight in there and then i've i've realized that probably for the last 20 years i've lived in my prefrontal cortex where i don't do anything now i i literally i only gave this advice to someone yesterday who's been going through a bit of drama and he said to me he goes what do you think I should do? And I said, never, ever, ever do anything when you're emotive. And he was like, what? I said, never. And I, 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 I've said before, I've always thought that I was quite a high functioning sociopath, right? And I thought that I'd actually been that from birth. But I now look at it, I think, no, I haven't. I've created that because that's part of my coping mechanism. And yes. I've, avoid, I've avoided so many more fights, especially in the last 25 years of my life. And the, the ones that I got into initially, I got into them because I had no way. And I know this makes me sound like all matrixy and stuff, but I had no way of being able to access from the act to the observe and the orient. And that was the first thing, right? So when you were saying it, I was like, shit, this is blowing my mind. Then the second thing is, if you're on WhatsApp, where you were talking about the prison movies and stuff, WhatsApp clips you get sent all the time of people getting beaten up. And every time, that all of the clips always have the same thing. My friends are going, how the hell did that happen? And I look at it and within 10 seconds of watching this, I'm like, how did that guy not know it was gonna happen? And that's not doing a third person perspective either. That's, you know, cause it's easy with the third person perspective. Cause you look at it, you go, well, you can see that guy doing it. But I was looking at it and going, but look at the menacing shape he's making. Yeah, that, and that's, as I said, I had to jump in there. So the two things, the first, the first thing was, I wouldn't mind being able to jump back into my limbic brain now, every now and again, which I'm finding harder and harder to get back into now. And I do, I do mean that because I, I used to have this thing, Mahi, years ago where, you know where, um, now you'll appreciate this because you'll have heard a few of the war stories. You know where the guy would say that, yeah, some guy will say that somebody was going to attack him. And then he said, I was going to fight him, but then I thought about maybe if the police get me and I, I could end up in jail. And I used to hear people say that, and I'd be like that, especially up until about 35. I'd be like, I've never given a shit about being thrown in jail. I'm just going to destroy this guy in front of me. But as the years have gone on, I, I have turned into that guy. But it's not through, you know, I, I'm... Again, I don't want to sound like Jordan Peterson. I'm not a well-behaved guy because I'm forced to be. I'm no a well-behaved <laughs> guy. Yeah, I'm not. I'm a well-behaved guy because I choose to be. Choose to be. That, yeah, that. I, so it's not the fact that I'm a weak guy and go. Oh well, I'll just avoid it. I'm like, no, you just, you just too much drama. So, yeah. but, but to get back to the speed thing, that's how we deal with it psychologically and in between the ears, right? So how does that translate 
into it, just it changes. moving our it, body. Yeah, it changes the kind of attributes you should work on, the syntax you should work on, right? If if you're if if you're already pretty fast, right? Say, say you're on the top five percentile of people in your movement skills, but your eyesight sucks. Okay, mm. or your decision systems, whether I should fight or not fight, sucks. Yeah, you're gonna be in deep shit, right? So the thing that I like to say is that you're not as fast as your body. You're as fast as this entire chain of observe to finish, mm. right? And you're only as fast as the weakest link there. If you have bad decision systems, you may be fast really fast and break the guy's neck in a bar fight over a stupid bump, okay? And then you spend, you get the pleasure of having 55 years of meditation solo in a confined room. So how fast were you? You were as fast as 55 years of wasted life. That my friend is super slow to learn the, con the idea of consequences. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, 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 so that's number one. And the number two is when we start observing the different ranges and, and, and now I'm just getting physical, the different ranges. And now where am I the slowest at the whip range or does my trapping and clinch suck or my grappling sucks? Now I'm able to isolate and say, okay, I've looked at the entire physical chain. I'm leaving the mental, emotional stuff out, just the physical chain. Right. So say we are at, uh, 21 feet. And I'm using that number because that's where the knife gets drawn and you know, you're know you now in danger, right? From 21 feet down to us making love, so to speak, you know, that entire range, right? At which range am I the fastest and which range am I the slowest? Then I, then I can begin to isolate and then design drills, design skill sets to enhance that piece. Right. So I, I understand the brilliance of build on your strengths. I get it. But the problem is it's like saying, okay, you know what? I have a fort. My north facing fort is strong. So I'll continue making that strong. I'll let my southern side fall because it's the weak link. That's not good. Yeah. Yeah. So so you want to find and fortify the pieces that are weakest. And and that becomes a way to now. Now you're looking at, okay, how do I fine tune and move to that next level, right? That's yeah. number one. And number two, that kind of approach only comes when you begin to plateau, right? Just be, and, and then you, you, you got to change your routines. You got to put new kinds of stress in your system and then you start tweaking it. Now, is this for everybody? No, you have to be an insane morpho to be wanting to do this, right? Yeah. But there are enough insane, insane guys because then it becomes... It becomes what is the art possible? And do you have the humility to make yourself a student over and over again? Because you know, in our industry, we have way too many masters and very few masterful students. That it's uh, it, yeah. Again, it's that that, that whole thing where it's uh, you've just you've just hit on something again. The idea of being a master because they always talk about the white belt mentality right so i will use jujitsu at the moment because i'm doing a load of jujitsu and it's a huge martial art right so i've got a load of my friends now where you talked about the plateau it's really funny because uh, you mentioned syntax earlier very important right so my, my friends are going i've hit the slump in jujitsu mick you said it was going to come and they talk about the slump and i'm like you haven't hit any slump. It's not like there's been there's been no disintegration of your skill set. What it is is you've plateaued, and they call it the slump because they think they're going downwards. And I'm like, so so what are you doing now? Are you still going back to the same position as you said? Yeah, if your half guard is really good, but your open guard is crap, well, as long as you're able to get that guy as your half guard all the time, then you don't have to worry about it. I, that, by the way, that's me. What I am, I'm very, very good at getting you back to where I need to kick the crap out of you when it comes to rolling, right? And I'll do just enough to, to do that. But I do the same in Jeet Kune Do. It's like Guru Daniel Santo said to me, he goes, 
too much jujitsu and Thai boxing, Mike. And I like, I do just enough. So he realizes that I am still working towards that. But it was, again, you said, as you were saying about like, it takes a special kind of idiot to want to keep pushing yourself to, to, to get masterful, right? Now, this is going to lead me into this. Speed has to, it has to sometimes uh, be affected by age. And the aging process is the one thing that we, none of us can outrun that. So how mm-hmm. do we, how do we uh, inoculate young. ourselves? Huh? Die, uh, young. die young. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I'm sorry, but I, I'm going nah, to, I'm going to leave, just, I'm going to leave I'm just, that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave I'm that to Kurt Cobain. Yeah, 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 I'm going to leave that to Kurt Cobain and Mama Cass. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for, for you younger viewers there, they, they were in the hit parade recently. No, no, but uh, I'll leave it to those guys instead. But so, yeah, how see, do you inoculate yourself to against the aging process? That's where so that's where you start moving from action into reading intent and observing better. Because physically you're slower, but you're better at reading tells and positioning yourself in a way and place so that your timing is superior than the opponent. And just with that in mind, right? We have Pat Strong. He's in his 80s coming in. And the dude is faster than I am. I mean, I'm not that fast, but he's faster than me, right? So it doesn't take much, but he's a lot faster than me. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's one then you have Olohe Jerry Walker who's in his 80s as well and uh, uh, he still beats the crap out of young blokes like me left right and center right so that's another kind of speed so the as you're aging what is this refinement and you know where you're building where you're building this next set of skills observing figuring out whether I want to be in this fight and how do I set this young you know, this young guy, because I'm a young kid to him, right? I mean, like I'm 49. What's a 49 year old kid? He, he basically calls me a kid, right? Compared yeah. to him. So he sets himself up so that I just fall into that trap, right? He beats me with experience. And we also have uh, from Stockton, Carlito Bonjok. Uh, he's been paralyzed waist down. And yet he's a master of his cream. You can't touch the man. So with these handicaps, whether you know you're unable, you've not moved out of a wheelchair, and you still keep masters and grandmasters at bay, to guys in their eighties dealing with young punks all the time, and saying, "Kid, there's more for you to learn." Okay, there's more for you to learn. <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, my, my the thing is, the, you just said, t- sorry, you just said t- two things. I've got, to, I've just got to have you. First of all using no limitation as a limitation or using limitation as no limitation. That was the first one. And then secondly, you've just given three examples of the classic, every martial arts movie always had it, of the aged master. And the classic, it's a trope, right? But the classic line always was the same as, I do exactly the same as you. I'm just a lot better at it. And that's that. But that's what's like, that's what's got me really, really enthused. So here. one of one of my one of my other teachers, um, uh, he used to go by the name of Traceless Warrior because he didn't want to be tracked. And I think I put I kind of he hates me for having him known in a way. You know, Mushtaq right. Ali Al Ansari. He's in his late seventies, and he still beats me up. With the campilan, with the stakes, with the rapiers. And I know physically I'm faster than him. I know that. But I don't get him. He gets me. So, <laughs> you know, so so I, I call them my lessons in humility. And apparently I have a lot to learn. So I keep going to get my ass handed to me <laughs> all the time. And if, if, if you, just as you, you, you know, she mentioned a few different martial arts there, right? So, what martial arts do you think lend the, so I'm going to put you on the spot here. So what sort of martial arts do you think in your personal experience lend themselves very well to get somebody who isn't fast to be able to attain a really good level of speed? Effectively? What kind of speed? Yeah, well, uh, we'll say physical first and then we'll, we'll talk about process and speed after that. I don't know, man. I would send them to fencing. I would send them to do fencing. I would, uh, I'm going to get hate for this, but I would, I would send them to Olympic Taekwondo, 
right? Uh, yeah. So I think where where the where the where the focus is on competition, uh, and you're working on refining those things, and then that is being pushed because when they have this idea, this focus on competition, you you have a well defined goal that hey I need to score, I need to do this, I need to do that. So that becomes the way for you to keep track, right? Uh, but many of us in the so called functional arts. We love to use the word functional and pressure testing, but are we ever really functional? Have you popped someone's eye open? Have you felt a blade go through a human body? Do you know what it feels like when the blood gushes out and goes all over your hands and gets sticky? We like the idea of so-called functional, right? But we haven't really tried it. So, so there, uh, there what happens is we are going for the gore um, and we are going for effectiveness, not necessarily speed. So, so to answer your question specifically on speed, that's why that answer. Well, it, it, it's, it's funny because I've actually used those two examples because I used to compete at karate. And I used to always say, it, first of all, it was violent tick. So literally it would just be, you're it. That would be it. But the other thing was that, and again, it's, you'll, get, you'll get some hate from the combatives groups over this the, oh, by the way you'll get hate from the guys who don't actually do any real training or sweat or do any sparring all the all the theorists always go mad because i i've i always maintain this you can take the piss out of olympic taekwondo right but you're going up an equally trained guy who knows he's going to fight and doesn't want to get hit fencing is exactly the same combatives nine times out of ten you're either blindsiding a guy or you're fighting a guy who's very, very, very emotionally involved. And if you can keep a cool head, nine times out of 10 as well, this is the other one. I know this is generalization, but most people who start fights are pretty shit at fighting because you know, they normally get people to back down. So the combatives group, I've always said, go up against, go, go up against a good blue belt with jiu-jitsu. Go up against yeah. a guy who's had maybe five fights in MMA. See, see what happens there. Yeah, yeah. That, that's and, one. And the guys who've really been in a real fight, and I'm not talking about a jiu-jitsu match, right? Let's keep yeah. matches out, right? Uh, a guy who's been in a real fight usually doesn't want to fight again. And if he wants to fight, he's a damn psychopath, right? Yeah. Uh, but usually the guy doesn't want to fight. Yeah, you no, know, it is the truth. It's like, uh, I had a conversation once with Eric Paulson over this and he, he pulled me up on it. He said, you've mentioned three times now, you know, jujitsu fights. He goes, they're matches, Mick. And I was like, felt like a fight to me. He went, no, no, no. A real fight he goes, did the guy try and kick you in the balls? And I went, no, he never. And he went, well, then it wasn't a real fight. And I was like, right, yeah. So, And also mate, you have to yeah. keep in mind asymmetry, right? Real fights have asymmetry, both in terms of your sizes, uh, you might be unarmed and he's armed, right? He has two other mates who are jumping in just to kick your head, to soften you up, right? Yeah. So asymmetry is the rule rather than the exception. Whereas in matches, symmetry is the rule. Do you know what? That, that, that literally, I'm, I'm making a note of that as we speak because I've, I've, I've never been able to put it as succinctly as that. Because I, I've always I've always said it's always in the other guy's favour. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's the classic you ever speak to a mugger. Yeah. You'd be a really, really shit mugger if you were picking up you're picking on guys who are swinging kettlebells every morning. You know, it's the victim selection, it's everything else that comes with it. it it's a crazy, it's a crazy situation. So, mate, that was the one for the physical speed. Now, for the processing speed what martial arts uh so i've got a sneaky feeling i've got i know what you're going to say but i'd like to hear from you what martial arts would you say would help with the process and speed you probably are not going to like the answer but um i would say armored combat right and the reason for that is when when you're playing with rules in armored combat like hema and things like that right uh You've taken the equation of getting hurt out, number one. 
and now it becomes a get a, a game of chess or go and you're you're learning how to process what should i do how how do i land this on the other person or get through the armor so that i've scored the point and he has to go away and then i go after the next guy right so i think i think that's number one and then on the other extreme i would say i would say good 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 judo jiu-jitsu aiki jiu-jitsu i'm not talking aikido i'm yeah. saying aiki jiu-jitsu where you know you actually have this idea of randori and free play uh, and there is um, you know gentleman's agreement and you're playing and you're still adding a little stress onto the system and saying okay what can we do what can we do so i think that the places where you can get into the sense of play deep play right there's trust uh, but there's also a little amount of controlled stress. Well, you, you said that I wouldn't like it, but my notes, I've got, I've got down any weaponry as long as it isn't Dog Brothers level, <laughs> right? Because, no, no, for the simple reason, yeah, 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 and I mean yeah. this in the nicest possible way. I know. That when, you're, when, you're, when you are doing the Dog Brothers level fighting, there are massive, massive repercussions because, like, the only time, I, the only thing, I, the only way that could be made worse, if they got rid of the hockey stick, uh, the hockey, the hockey gloves, right? You need to have some sort of head protection. I, I just believe in that, but I don't think a fencing mask gives you the adequate protection you need, right? And the hockey, the hockey gloves, they give you adequate protection for the hands. But you, like I've seen, I've seen so many fights start and finish with defanging the snake, right? And guess what? At that point there, all you see is one guy being aggressive and the other guy being very reticent after that point, right? I had that. And then the other thing that I put on my notes was judo because jujitsu is still... Um, I hear you. I, I think the thing is, if, we, if, if I put this into like familial terms, judo is the overachieving older brother who still has to prove something and jujitsu is the snot-nosed kid who's been allowed to get away with murder for ages with his mom and dad and can turn up in flip-flops and say, well, we're only sort of fighting because I've got friends of mine who are judokas. And when we roll at jujitsu, I have to explain to them that we're actually friends. Like in yeah. half an hour's time, I'm going to go and train with my friend Wayne Lakin. And I'll have to tell him this is not the Thunderdome because he will, his newaza is horrible. And I'm like, dude, I, I, I don't I, know. I'm, you know, I think we're on the same page. And I like that analogy. And I would say Aiki Jiu-Jitsu is the father of the grandfather who's gone a step beyond. And it's like, I, I want to be able to do this with all my weapons, not just empty hand. I want to be yeah. able to play with this. And I want to use very little effort because uh, I'd rather go use the energy with my woman back home than spend it all on you. That's a real warrior right there. The one thing, though, Mahi, is you're certainly not Brazilian when you talk about things like that. Hicks and Gracie famously said that he wouldn't sleep with his wife because it took away the vital energy. Right? And that's what, that's what he said. And I remember Tank Abbott saying, if five minutes with your wife is like having 25 minutes in the cage with me, I'd get a new wife. Yeah. So, sorry about that. You know, Tank Abbott and Hicks. On. But yeah, that's the one that's always, always amazed me. Yeah, the guys are like, oh, yeah, it'll drain. Boxers, pretty women will drain your legs. You know what I mean? And you're like, really? What is this? There, 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 there was a reason. Movie? No, but there was a reason why armies didn't allow fraternizing between men and women and why before war they were cut off from all women, right? And why they want young bucks because the T levels are high. And if they are not able to drain it, as you said, right? then it becomes aggression that wants to eat everything in its way. So it, it's a balance. But my point was that, you know, as you get older, um, you don't want just the quantity of your life to go up. What good is it if I win the fight with you and you've taken both my knees out for the rest of my life, right? Yeah. I want the quality of my life also to go up. So when we are thinking martial arts, when we are thinking speed uh, or any attribute, right? The goal is I want to improve the quantity and the quality of my life. Otherwise, what good it is? I, I think a lot of people focus so much on the quantity of their life and you see them completely 
fuck up their bodies for the lack of a better term yeah. beyond compare and then they spend uh, you know uh from the 30s all the way let's say they live to be 70 they spend 40 years thinking about the good old days when you did shit or how bad how bad life is now so yeah. mate we really should think about your decisions and how you think about life you know because what good what good is your mastery or the lack of your mastery that you can no longer do things and you have to rely on things i did where is your improvement where is your next stage of development where is it you're going from a young buck to that wise leader to that wise tribal council yeah it, well it it, it 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 you know you you have hit on something you're talking about everything now that's going to be demonized in today's society you see that's that's the problem it's like you know that classic line you know most men lead lives of quiet desperation and you're yep. like yes yes got that and then i don't know was it was it plato that said well, it was oh, i'm paraphrasing now but it was to do with the uh one of the greatest tragedies in life is for a man not to be able to find out like the physical limitations and the, the exceptionalism that they can get i know yeah, i'm paraphrasing yeah. that but yeah. it's like you look at it and you go how could you not be like that oh you know as we were coming on, Will said, "Will said, you know, you look very Hemingway-esque. And I, 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 I do this jujitsu now. I, I say to people all the time, I'm like, I'm halfway to 110. How are you not able to beat me up? And they're, they're like, oh, yeah, but you've been at it longer than me. And I'm like, yeah, but 12 years time, mate, I'm retiring. You know, how, come on. I thought you guys were supposed to be tough these days. But uh, yeah, it is. It is funny. It's like, I, what I'd write, what I'd really like to get your thoughts on is we talked about speed. So what are the attributes like strength, power? How do these all figure into? Because speed's only one part of it. Yeah. So, 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 so right now I'm focusing on speed, right? So I want this to be a 40 hour master class on speed. Yeah. I mean, I, a lot of people throw the word master class out, right? But the word master class comes from music where you already knew how to play music and you went to work on a specific attribute yeah. and fine tune that attribute. So in that sense, this is a true masterclass on speed. So the goal is that in the next few years, there are a few other pieces that I will look at, like uh, what, is, what is core strength? Uh, what is functional strength? Uh, how do you develop that? You know power and look at it looking at it more holistically uh i don't want to give away all the pieces of it yeah. but looking at it very holistically sensitivity you know looking at uh, the whole nine yards not just chi sao from wing chun well you but you see yeah but this is it when you when you talked about this when you talked about beyond wing chun and beyond chi sao beyond sensitivity that was the, that was what got me fascinated because i thought okay speed and I focused too much on intention. So the problem with me was I wasn't thinking about the physical act. I was thinking about how am I able to get my synapses, boom, kick, we're straight in there. And then the, if, if you don't mind, because I, 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 I'm conscious of taking up too much of your time. No, but, not at all. What, 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 but what I'd like to know is you mentioned about beyond Chi Sao, beyond Wing Chun. We don't want to get into a Wing Chun war where we have to start fighting guys in garages any, anymore. But can you explain to me how can we be, get beyond this? Yeah. You want me to go Oppenheimer way? See, with Heisenberg, now you have, you have a whole bunch of atoms that are in, yeah, in yeah. The, but they are still connected. And you move one and the other one moves inexplicably across time. So why do we have to keep them in the same room at arm's length and do things? Why can't Chi Sao be done at the level of intention? Wow. Now you've got me thinking. Yeah. Now. Think, about a, think about a dog fight, right? Where you have two bombers facing each other. They're maneuvering all over. It's not just like, okay, let's get here and wrestle it up. Right? To me, this is the worst place to be. What the fuck were you doing from here to here? Yeah. Well, it, French, it, it, but you know. <laughs> no, 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 no. Because no, you. Well, you see, I'll, when I'm teaching, especially when I teach Carly, I always like to throw a lot of Sun Tzu in there, and it's not to make me sound smart. It's just the fact that Sun Tzu does it way better than I do. 
and we talk about you know changing elevation and i talk about outmaneuvering and say right okay yeah a full front assault used to work then we start a move, maneuvering and then guess what then what we were doing we were striking we were counter striking and everything i always find in carly always comes back to numerado but then the thing is it's like jujitsu yeah what's the best place where's the best place to be on someone's back why because i can yeah. inflict the most amount of damage yeah. and i'm safe numerado what do we do as soon as you get past that angle to get to his back as quick as possible and just do your fork out and stab and hit them right but because yeah, it, so, you got lost in the drill yeah you've taken away his observability and orientation completely and that's why you win right but yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you, you know, I like, and I think, you know, just to paraphrase what you said, you know, like, again, to quote Sun Tzu, if you just focus on tactics and forget strategy, bye-bye, mate. <laughs> oh, man, I'll tell you what, that, that is, that is, uh, yeah, that guy was smart. I don't, I, you know, I, every time, every time I reread The Art of War, I'm just like, uh, this is how old? 500 years before Jesus? Wow. Now yeah. we're talking. Yeah, it's I, think, it's, it's, I think someday we should talk about two other guys, you know. There's a guy called Chanakya in India and his art of strategy and his art of fighting that hardly anybody knows about, right? And the other guy is uh, Clausewitz, you know. His, his work on war was brilliant. So Ooh, I think... Oh, so yeah. that, do you know what? Well, that, that is... I think that's the best... That, that, that's a good place for us to wrap up anyway. But more importantly, that's a great place to jump into next time we talk, mate, because I always love, I always love chatting to you anyway. You're, you're a very, in, very, very intelligent guy. Always make me, I, again, this, this, I'm going to show that I, I am actually a new man, right? I went to see Oppenheimer this week, but last week I went to see Barbie. And wow. do you know what will freak you out? This is no word of a lie, right? This is no word of lie. I came out of Oppenheimer and I was like, right, okay. I knew I was going to dig that quantum physics, everything. Came out of Barbie and I had more questions because what, Bar what people don't tell you about the Barbie movie is this existential angst and it's spoiler alert here if you haven't seen it. It is Adam and Eve in reverse. It is such an amazing movie to watch. And then everyone's going, Oh, feminism. And I'm like, really? Ken was in the real world, Mahi. Ken was in the world, real world, for three hours. He went back. And when he went back, the president of the United States in Barbie world was serving him beer. And I'm like, what? And that made men look bad? That made, that made men look great. You know, it was, it was unreal. But yeah, as, as, as I was going to say, every time, every time I speak to you, it's like watching Barbie. Because you leave me with <laughs> oh more my God. questions. No, I mean that in a good way. I hope I not in that. the same way, no, my friend. No, 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 no. Hey, come on. Yeah, Mahi, I'm going to show it like, and we're going to keep this in the show, right? My wife said to me, do you want to go and see Barbie? I don't know if you'll like it. And I'm like, two and a half hours of watching Margot Robbie in different skimpy outfits. Try and stop me going to see Barbie. And I came out of it and I was like that going, oh no. As like, guys, if you're watching and you haven't seen it, trust me, go and see it because it will pose so many questions. It's really, really good. And Oppenheimer, I'll tell you something. May, first of all, I'm going to sign off and say thank you very much. Because thank I'm you, going to be very, But I'm going to be very, very flippant on the next bit, right? If you haven't seen Oppenheimer, spoiler alert, Oppenheimer likes sleeping with communists. That's all I'm going to say. Because in the movie, every woman he sleeps with is a communist. Yeah, I'll tell you something. I don't know how that's number one in America. Anyway, Mahi, thank you for your time as always, brother. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> I got to sign off, guys. Okay? All take right, care. take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.